Hey guys, how are you doing? So we have a really exciting class today. We're going to talk about branding, which I think is one of the most interesting subjects when you're putting together your business, you're developing or you're redeveloping your business, because really your brand is everything. Your brand is what makes you different from all the other businesses out there, all the other offers that are on the market. Your brand is what makes you special and unique. And there are three key elements to branding. And those are your brand values, which is what you stand for, what your brand represents to the world. There's your voice, which is how you express your brand, how you put it across to people, how you tell them what you're doing. And then the third element is your visuals, your style, your logos, the font you choose, your paperwork, your website, all of those things. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to divide this into two classes because there's just so much in this. So we're going to do, today we're going to do values and voice and then we're going to do visuals in a separate class. But I think that branding is perhaps one of the most under looked at elements of business, especially in places like Amazon. When you're selling on Amazon, you don't have to think too much about brand. And a lot of that is because you might be selling other people's brands. You might be selling products from other people where they've already done the work, like Mattel or Hasbro or whatever brand you're selling on Amazon. They've already done the work to establish their brand. But I also see it very much overlooked by private label sellers. A lot of private label sellers just basically say, okay, my brand is my logo, my trademark, and the packaging of my product. But your brand is so much more than that. And you have so much potential to put your brand out there across all platforms. And this is something that's really, really key when you're thinking about brand. Your brand is what makes you recognizable on every platform. So it doesn't matter where you go. You can be on on your own website, you can be on Amazon, you can be on YouTube, you can be on Facebook, but you are the same brand wherever you go. And that is incredibly powerful and it's also incredibly valuable because platforms change. We we know that social media platforms change. MySpace wasn't here forever. Or Spreecast, Blab, Meerkat, like none of these were around forever. Yerdle, like there's so many platforms that we've we've used, we've experimented with just in the last three years that aren't around anymore or don't have the value that they once did. So we have to build and invest in our own brand, our own intellectual property, our own space in people's brains and memories so that we can survive in what's a very changing environment. So I think that brand is vital Whatever you're doing, whether you're providing a service, whether you're providing a product, like even if you're an accountant or a real estate agent or something that's very much one-on-one, you are still representing your brand. Everything you do, your business card, your letters to clients, the way you speak to people, all of that is representative of your brand. So let's dig in and start talking about your brand values and your brand voice. Okay, so here are two images that I think just sum up the power of branding. This is Old Spice before and after their rebranding with the Old Spice guy. And I think this is just such an incredible comparison to look at these two images. This is how Old Spice used to present themselves. And there's a lot of things going on here. You've got the image of the gentleman and he's got his rose in his hand and he's wearing a tie and suit. So obviously that's their sort of customer avatar. That's the the customer that they're trying to sell to. They have the old spice packaging itself is in this very old fashioned, these bottles with the ship on. And of course they're old fashioned. It's an old picture. But it's not particularly bright or eye-catching. The the bottles are all white and the ship is kind of muted. And then you've got the voice, the finest in grooming aids for him. And so they're they're not really claiming anything particular for for what it's going to do for for their customers other than groom them. It's it's, it's good for your grooming. Now, take a look at like the new up-to-date Old Spice guy. I mean, first of all, he's like, he's almost superhuman because he's like bulging. This guy's like huge. So he's like a kind of hyper real customer avatar. Like this isn't who their customers are. This is who their customers aspire to be. 
So you have this guy who's just like this huge, huge character. And it says, smell is power. So they're selling something here. They're selling an emotion right here. Like if you smell good, you're going to feel awesome. You're going to feel powerful. You can go out and take on the world. You can smash through walls with this. And the packaging is now bright red. And it has all these like animals and these tough sort of bears and, and eagles. And it's called Hawkridge and Wolfthorn. And there's all this stuff that's going on here. I think it's kind of interesting that they kept the logo. They held on to the italic logo as a throwback to the original Old Spice. But you can see this huge change in their branding. And with that, you can see how much more valuable their product becomes. I mean, like when you think about it, if you're walking down the supermarket aisles, what is going to appeal to you? Is it the finest grooming aids or is it smell is power? You're going to pick up the bright red bottles. You're going to pick up the things that make you feel powerful and awesome. So the reason I am sharing this is because it shows just how critical brand is in determining your customers' buying decisions and, and how you're going to reach customers. And more importantly, or as importantly, how to get your customers talking. Like your customers are more likely to share things like this and say, whoa, look at this advert. This is crazy. Than they are to say, oh, yeah. I mean, the grooming aids boring utterly boring no one's going to talk about it no one's going to share about it but the old spice guy people share that stuff all the time he's become a meme he's a character he's on a horse like all of those things so hopefully from just taking a look at these pictures we can start to see how important it is to really think about your brand and to do something strong with your brand to do something interesting and unique with it and not just to sort of be another white bottle on the supermarket shelf so I put a couple of quotes in here. I've got one by Denise Lee Yon, and I'm going to talk about her a little bit more later on in this class because she's really interesting. And she wrote a book called What Great Brands Do. And she says, people buy according to how brands make them feel or what identity they help them experience and express. And I think this is so important that buying is so often an emotional decision. And even if it's something you need, even if it's a product that you literally need, like kitchen paper, you're still gonna look at brands. We still have that sense of like, oh, Bounty is like the strongest kitchen paper because we're told that so many times. That's how they present themselves as their brand. And so we still have kind of an emotional hook to all these brands. We wanna buy things because we think they're gonna make our kitchen more beautiful, more shiny, and we're, they're going to make everything better. I also really like this quote from Seth Godin. He says, A brand's value is merely the sum total of how much extra people will pay or how often they choose the expectations, memories, stories, and relationships of one brand over the alternatives. So he's saying your brand's value is what makes you different from the other guys, what makes you different from the other products on the shelves or on the Amazon listing. Why would people choose you? And he mentions expectations. And I think that's a really, really key point that a brand sets expectations. But I also think it's really interesting that he mentions stories because we've been talking a lot about stories, about, about both your own story and your customer's stories. Your brand's stories are also a big part of that. And he mentions relationships. People think about the relationship they have with your brand. They think about what it means to them. Like, what does the old Spice Guy mean to a customer? And there's a whole load of psychological things that can be going on there. The people are like, I want to be like that. I want to have what he has. I want my husband to be like that. I want him to have all these things. Like, there's a lot of thoughts that people have about their relationship with your brand. And it's kind of interesting because if you think about it, the Pepsi challenge was like a really famous promotion that Pepsi used to do in the 90s. But in actual fact, they found when they, when they conduct the Pepsi challenge, which you have two unmarked cups, one has Pepsi, one has Coke, and then you drink it and see if you can tell which one's Pepsi and say, oh, this is the better one, obviously, because it's Pepsi. They found when they've done that in controlled experiments, people don't really know the difference between Pepsi and Coke. However, if they are told this is Pepsi, this is Coke, then they apply all of these new thoughts to it. Like, oh, Pepsi's sweeter. It's got a, 
a more peppy taste, it has this, it has that. People really judge a product by their existing knowledge of the brand, what they know of the brand, what they've seen of the brand, the brand's visuals, all of those things. So brand is crucial. It is really, really important to your sales. So what is brand? Well, I, I really sat down and thought about this and wrote down a lot of the thoughts I have about what brand is, because it is so many things and it's such a big topic. But the most important definition I could think of for brand, and I wrote this down at the top, is branding is consistency plus emotional appeal. So your brand sets and maintains your customer's expectations, and it does that through consistency. You always have the same voice, the same values. Your visuals don't always have to be identical, but you have this consistency in how you present yourself, in how you put your brand values and voice across. So what you don't want to do is jar people. So like if, for example, you've been doing women's rights, my company is all about empowering women and making women feel very strong. You don't want to suddenly do an advert that says you throw like a girl. Like you have to say consistent and stay on message because something like that really jars your customers and throws them off. You have to give them their expectations and meet their expectations. So branding is very much about being consistent, maintaining your values no matter what. And this class is going to be very much based about what your brand's values are. So uphold them consistently. The second element is emotional appeal. People will buy from your brand because of the emotions it gives them. And, and that, as I say, that's all tied up in aspirations, what they want to be, what they think your brand will help them with, and their personal relationship with your brand. Is your brand for them? Does it speak to them? Is it giving them the message they want to hear? Do their values align with yours? So the key elements I see of branding are consistency and emotional appeal. Now, here are some of the other thoughts that I put down about branding. One of the key ones is that branding is for the long term. So when you come up with your idea for your brand and you start putting down what your brand values are, you've got to think long term with this. Is this something that you're going to be happy with you and your products and your services representing for the long term? And I think often people tend to go wrong because they'll see a short term opportunity and they'll say, we've got to get in on this. But it can be very damaging to your brand to do that. Like if you've created sort of pacifist hippie yogurt products and that's your thing, you sell yogurt in Whole Foods and it's very peaceful brand and then suddenly you get an offer to go and sponsor a UFC fight and you have pacifist yogurt and like then your customers are going to be like what what I don't like this I'm not happy with this or if a company like Lush who've always been very pro social rights and very against animal testing if they suddenly change their values, and they kind of did, they started putting in a lot more chemical ingredients. And then I was like, oh, I don't really want to buy from you guys. I, I don't really like what you're putting in your stuff anymore. And that is so damaging to a brand when they, they make that sort of short term money grab or a cash based decision. Then I think that can really damage a brand. I think Warren Buffett, it's attributed to Warren Buffett. He said it takes 20 years to build a brand and only five minutes to ruin it. And I think that's so, so true. You, you want to guard your brand very carefully, especially, especially if it has your name on it, because you can't get away from that. And with Facebook, how it is now and with all the social media, if you screw up your name and you get a bad personal reputation, you have a huge problem. So don't base your brand on short term trends. Always try and think long term. And if you are going to, if you do get that big offer, like, okay, you want to sponsor a UFC fight, but your brand is based in pacifism, then maybe you have to think about rebranding and how you can take that opportunity and find a new change that's within your brand values. So you might have to change like your brand values at that point and say, okay, now we're about being like victory and being a champion. And you have to find a way to make that segue into a new brand value. But generally, you don't want to do it unless it's for the long term. Hold on to your brand and guard it. Now, a brand is also 
an expression of your values. So this kind of leads on from what I'm saying. Like your brand is you putting your values and your interests out into the world. And you're pretty much sort of infusing your business with your personal values. So you don't have to do this. I mean, it's perfectly, a lot of people go and work for companies where they don't really sort of share in the values. But if you're running a business, you want to put your heart into the business. You're going to be spending long hours on your business. So it will be much, much easier for you if you are genuine. If you hate what you're doing, if it depresses you, and if you're like selling something that you feel, like if you're buying a lot of stuff from, like a, a lot of toys from China and you're kind of iffy on the safety of them, you're not going to feel very happy. You're going to be worried about that. You're not going to feel like you can sell them and, and be genuine saying, these are the best quality toys. These are toys I love. You're going to have that little grain of doubt. So be happy with what you're selling and what you're doing. Put your values into your brand. It will be so much easier for you to sell whatever it is you're selling. Like I, I find it very hard to sell something that I don't believe in. If I've used something and I'm not keen on it or I, and so I'm really picky as well. So there's very few things I want to sell and actually market and talk about because I want everything that I promote to be something I really genuinely believe in because it just, it kind of eats you up if it doesn't. So I do think it's a great idea to put your real values into your brand. It's your business, it's your products. So make it something you love. I mean, you're going to be doing this for a lot of your life. So put something in it that you really believe in. Now, I put a Henry Ford quote in here as well because I thought this was really cool. Your brand is what you actually do. You can't build a brand on what you are going to do. So this kind of goes back to right in the beginning when we were talking about authenticity, congruence, make your actions match your words. So your brand is about what you're actually doing, the products you're actually creating and selling, not what you hope to do. So take action and keep injecting your products and your actions with your brand. Your brand is also your voice. Your brand is the way that you communicate with the world, whether that's on social media, whether it's how you talk to your customers face to face, or even whether it's the descriptions and the listings that you put on Amazon, the vocabulary that you put in there. So branding is very much your voice. It's how your customers hear and see and perceive you. And then this quote is really, really cool. It comes from a lady called Lisa Gansky. And she said, your brand is your voice and your product is a souvenir of your brand. So you take home a product that is a souvenir of your whole brand. So what's interesting here is I think that selling on Amazon particularly and selling online tends to train us or selling online on other people's platforms tends to train us to think in terms of product. And we think in terms of individual products, like, okay, I'm going to sell bottles of kombucha on Amazon. How do I sell kombucha? What do I do with kombucha? But this turns it around. This is what is really important is your brand, your voice. Products are merely a souvenir of that. So if you start thinking of yourself, like, like think about bands, think about sort of like rock stars, you're going to love a particular rock star or a particular band. You probably, your favorite band, you're going to love no matter what they do. But their albums are what you buy. Those are the souvenirs. And in many ways, like what you do as a brand, especially if what you're doing involves any kind of service, involves any kind of training or teaching or any kind of communication, your brand is probably way more important than the products themselves. You can keep bringing out products. You can create new products. Creating products now is easy. It's easy. You don't have to be invested in one product. What is really important is you, your voice, the culture you're creating, the style you're showing people. All of that is so, so important. Your products are just the souvenir of that. Your branding is also your look and style. We're going to talk about that in the next class, so I'm not going to go too deep on that, but look and style of your brand is so, so crucial. Whether you're bright and colorful, whether you have pastel colors, whether you, you sort of do the black and white, grayscale kind of cool muted style, all of that is really key to your brand. And again, it's just an expression of your voice. How does your brand look? What do people expect? 
and does your look and style meet with those expectations? Your brand is also what differentiates you from your competition. Like this is huge. This goes right back to the beginning. What makes you different? What makes your brand different from all the other brands on the shelf? And I see it a lot on Amazon when people are selling private label products. They'll just buy, everyone buys the same product from overseas and they all put their own label on it. And it's so boring. It's so boring because just being called sort of chef master or cook master or kitchen master, like that doesn't change anything. You're the same as the other guy. All of these brands look the same. Now you can sell your own products. You can compete with people if you have a good brand, if people look at it and say, oh, I know that brand, I recognize that brand, I like what that brand stands for. Or if they look at it and go, wow, these people are different, these people are interesting. Like if you have, like if everyone else is selling like wooden spoons, but you're selling zombie wooden spoons, that's gonna stand out by like a mile. They're gonna be like, oh, I like zombie brands, they're funny, yeah, they're interesting, they always look cool in my, like Alienware computers. Perfect, perfect example. You know, most computers look the same, especially PCs. Macs are a little bit different, but PCs all kind of look the same. I'm not even sure now what brands there are in PCs because I look at them and I'm like, okay, they're just boring computers. But Alienware have always done something really neat with their computers. They have glowing keyboards, they have aliens on the back, and you know that they've always marketed as being very high powered gaming machines. So you look at Alienware and they stand out a mile from the competition because of the name, because of the look, because of the message that they're these high powered machines. So having something interesting about your brand will really help you differentiate. Good branding is also about attention to detail. You've got to think about everything you do that touches a customer, whether it's you or in fact touches anyone. If you're speaking to people, If you're meeting people at a conference, then you're representing the brand. If the packaging on your products represents your brand, your listings on Amazon represent your brand, your website, your stationery, everything you do that touches a customer or a competitor or anyone else, that's part of your brand. So you have to stay with your brand in all the levels of detail, everything you do, everything you put out there. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be super glossy, super professional. And in fact, I often see people do sort of headshots on Facebook wearing a suit. And it doesn't work that well on Facebook because that's not really the right sort of environment for headshots and and suits. It looks very, very stuffy. So you don't always have to be sort of super on brand. And in fact, being super on brand, like always dressing professionally and writing everything in very formal English, that can actually be kind of disturbing in itself. But attention to detail means always upholding your values, making sure your values come across in everything you do and making sure generally your voice is consistent and the promises that you make to customers are consistent. So just try not to break customers' expectations. And with that in mind, another point is commitment and integrity. Like stay with it. And this is really reiterating what we said in the beginning. Branding is for the long term. It is about your values. It's about putting something real out there and it's about sticking with it. Don't compromise and break character. If someone challenges your brand, then that's good. That's good. If someone says, hey, why do you guys do this? What is the thing with this? That's actually an opportunity for you to look at it and say, no, there's a good reason we do this. And this is the good reason we do it. And sometimes those challenges, those questions can actually help you reinforce your brand. And it's like sometimes people can come and troll you. Like, for example, I mean, I'm very, I tend to be very inclusive or I try to be very inclusive with our groups. So I'm like, yeah, I put a rainbow flag on my little pony character when it was Pride Day. I totally am happy with standing up and saying, yes, I absolutely welcome people who are gay or or people who have different backgrounds. I'm happy to bring those people into our group and work with those people. And then once in a while, you get someone who comes along, well, I think this is terrible. I don't think you should be doing that. I think a weak brand will go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. Whereas 
like a strong brand can step back from that and say, I'm sorry you feel like that. I'm sorry you feel that way. We do believe this. And I think you really have to stand up for those things. You have to stand up for your values because that's what your brand is built on. If you let just something like that sort of chip away at your values, it damages your whole brand. So stick with it, set your brand and stick with it. And right there, I've kind of reiterated, I've been saying it over and over, but brand is important because it sets and maintains your customer's expectations. And that's so important. You want to tell, like customers want to know what they're going to get from you. You have to set their expectations realistically and then you have to maintain them. And that's really all there is to having happy, positive, committed customers who will keep returning to you, who will keep listening to you, who will buy from you again and again. So I put a link down here. I talked about this lady earlier, but she's called Denise Lee Yon. And I loved this quote from her as well. She said, great brands don't have to make a special point of giving back because they deliberately create shared value for all their stakeholders, including their communities. They use the power of their brands to inspire change and have a beneficial impact on society. And I love this. I love this because what she's saying is that your brand is bigger than you. Like your brand is a vehicle for you to actually create some change and to do some good in the world and to help express your values in the world. So a brand is an amazing thing. Having a brand gives you just a new tool to use to actually help make the world something you want to see, help make the world a place that you want to live and work in. And you can use your brand to do that. So I love what she's saying there. And if you have an hour and you want to watch something that's gonna inspire you, be interesting, then there's a link to her video there where she's addressing the University of Irvine. So really cool to watch that. Okay, so I know I said a lot of things about branding there, but I made you a little sort of wanky quote with my name on because these are the three things that I think are most important about branding and the things to really kind of internalize and remember when you're thinking about branding. And these are the three things. So branding is consistency. It's staying consistent no matter what. And it's emotional appeal. It's how your customers connect to you on an emotional level, their relationship with your brand and all the emotions that your brand gives them. Branding sets customer expectations. And this is so crucial. I mean, when people are standing wondering what product to buy, you need to have set their expectations. They need to know, oh, this product will meet what I need. This product will meet my needs. So you are setting that expectation. You're telling them like, okay, this deodorant will work for you. It will help you get girls. It will help you feel awesome at work. You'll feel confident. You don't feel sweaty. Like you are setting that expectation and setting a realistic expectation. And lastly, everybody needs a brand. No matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, every time you put your name out there, every time you send an email, every time you create a listing, you are representing your brand and everybody needs a brand. Okay, so now we can get down to work and start really solidifying what it is that makes up your brand. And hopefully this will really help you to take some time now to set out these values, these ideas, and to actually get them written down because it will really help inform everything you do later when you start building communities, when you start building products. Having an idea of these values will really, really help with that process so that you're not so much sitting and thinking, am I doing the right thing? Is this in line with what I want to do? Is this the right kind of product for me to make? Am I targeting the right people? This will hopefully help you create that foundation along with the work you've done on yourself, your audience, your products. Putting some groundwork in on your brand is going to help you down the line. I put this little quote in by Richard Branson because I really like what he's saying here. I think it's very reassuring. On the previous slide, I said you need to be consistent. You need to pay attention to details in your brand, but you don't have to be super glossy and super professional. And I love what Richard Branson says here because he says, too many companies want their brand to reflect some idealized, perfected image of themselves. As a consequence, their brands acquire no texture and no character. So I love this idea that you can present yourself and your brand 
as you are, as you really feel. Like, put the quirks in, put the weird things in there. It's okay. Like, if your brand represents what you're actually doing, what you actually feel, what you're actually thinking, everything is so much easier. Your customers will like you more. You'll find it easier to make decisions. You'll enjoy your work a whole lot more than if you're going, oh, I don't really feel very comfortable with this. So keep this in mind. You don't have to be glossy and perfect and super professional. You just have to present yourself in a real awesome way. Okay, so I included a couple of links down at the bottom, and I think these are really, really good if you want to go deeper on any of these concepts. But this is where I found these three Ps, and I think this is a really helpful framework to use when you're coming up with your brand values. So the first question it asks is, what's wrong with your industry? And that sounds like such a negative place to start, but it's really not. It's actually... It's not so much go and rip apart your competitors, but it's about looking at whatever niche you're in, whatever industry you're in, and saying, well, what's missing? What isn't fulfilled? And a really good way to do this is to look at your own experiences. So for example, I mean, I, I'm thinking about maybe gluten-free food. Like, let's pick that as a niche. I want to sell gluten-free food. What's wrong with your industry? Well, we have one gluten-free bakery, and it's really good. They have amazing cakes. They have amazing muffins and a lot of these things. But I went there to talk to them about wedding cakes. And I was very put off by their customer service. The guy didn't seem like he cared that much about building a wedding cake. And he was like, well, the, the lady who comes in and does wedding cakes, she's not going to be here. I don't know when she'll be here. So that was kind of a strike. Like, okay, they weren't like, yes, we want to do wedding cakes. And it was kind of ironic because they have the pictures of wedding cakes all around saying, ask us about wedding cakes. But then when you do ask, they're like, yeah, she might be in on Tuesday. So that's, that's a problem. Like, okay, the, the customer service wasn't there. And then when I talked to them, they weren't very good about personalizing it or customizing it. So that's sort of another thing that's missing. Okay, I couldn't get customized gluten-free wedding cakes and so on. So you can look at this for, for any industry that you're in, whatever it is you're selling. Think about what's missing. Who aren't they catering for? Are they catering for people who have disabilities? Are they catering for people who might not speak English as their first language? Who is missing? Is there kosher gluten-free food? Is that a thing? Is there gluten-free food for people who really like sort of eating buttery fair food? Why isn't there gluten-free food at the fair? So there's all of these ideas you can look at for say, what's wrong with your industry? And then what you look at is you and your expertise. What is special about you? What do you know about? And this is really cool because you can take all your personal knowledge or your personal interests and start applying those to the industry and say, well, okay, maybe people can't make gluten-free wedding cakes, but I can look at my expertise worksheet and say, well, I planned a wedding recently. I did that. I, I had a, a beach wedding. I planned it all myself. So I do know a little more about what people are looking for when they choose a wedding cake. So that's something I could bring to the subject of gluten-free foods. I can also look at my personal interests, like, hey, I like video games. What if you made gluten-free snacks for video gamers? That would be pretty cool. No one's doing that. And you start looking at these two things, where the gaps are, what's missing, and then look at what you do that's really interesting and really special. And when you look at merging those two things like where is there an intersect where do those things meet and of course i mean for me i think wedding cakes would be a great brand proposition like gluten-free wedding cakes that are customized with great customer service boom that would be a brand proposition but you can find so many other things and what i suggest is go back to your expertise worksheet when you're doing this and look through your expertises look through that's not a word um, look through your list of expertise and find the things that you know about that are unique, that you can bring to an industry. And they don't have to be from the same industry. Like, for example, I just bought in video games. I said I really like video games and maybe I can make video game cakes. So I'm bringing something from a completely different industry to the industry of cakes and gluten-free cooking. So look at merging those things and you can create your brand proposition there. The second P in finding your true values is the personality of your brand. 
Do you have hobbies or passions that are interesting? So this kind of leads on from the proposition and, and we're talking about what makes you special and what's unique about you. Well, this takes it a little step further. Like, what do you do that's particularly interesting? And you might see, for example, that, I don't know, if I look at my kombucha drink, it tells me about GT Dave, the founder. And he says he made it in his mother's kitchen uh, because love is our number one ingredient. So, like, literally, I'm just looking, reading this off my kombucha there. His quirky thing is love. Love is the number one ingredient. So you kind of get to an insight into what GT Dave is about. He's obviously a guy that's very kind of loving and very open and, and he says love is what drives his kombucha. And it kind of shows because then he has like his words of enlightenment and he sells it in Whole Foods. And it's it's a very sort of positive hippie kind of vibe to the whole thing. And I mean, I think that is really awesome. He's brought his personality into the product. Now, I don't know if I was going to make kombucha, maybe I would make it like a, an energy drink for all night video gaming. Like you can bring your hobby and your passion into the product that you're working on and use your weird personalities or your weird personality quirks. Like, for example, I mean, I'm always playing with Pony when I'm when I'm doing videos. I have like my stuffed Pony and sometimes I bring her into the into the video and it's kind of because she's always sitting around the house and she's like a toy that sometimes I use if I'm having an argument with Isaac I'll be like talk to Pony and tell it to Pony she's over there I can't bring her but use these weird things that you have if you have some weird joke or something funny that you you enjoy or that you say then can you bring that to your brand and I love this made with love by really really pretty blonde girls moods of Norway. Like, I thought that was amazing that the, this company are kind of just bringing what's unique about them. Like, they're obviously like a bunch of Norwegian girls making clothes. Like, why not ride off that? It's much more fun than like this was made in some random sort of factory in Taiwan. Like, this gives the product something very unique and kind of upvalues it as well. It, it makes people willing to spend more on that product if they know something about where it came from, who's putting it together and why. So personality, we've got proposition and we've got personality. Okay, so the third P, and this might be one of the most important or might be the most important, is purpose. What is the purpose of your brand? Now, don't have an existential crisis here because I have enough existential crises for all of us. But the question is, why does your brand exist? Now, you may not have created your brand yet. If that's the case, that's fine. That's okay. But start thinking about why should your brand exist? Why will your brand exist? And a good question to ask yourself is why did you start it? And this is kind of a difficult question sometimes. You think, well, I started it because I needed money. I wanted to run a business and I wanted to make money. Well, that doesn't really answer why did you start this brand? Because there are all kinds of other ways to go and make money. I mean, you, you can go and, and try and get a job. You can work for someone else. There's a lot. Of, I mean, you could have started a cupcake business or started a hairdresser's. You were focused on your particular brand or product for a reason. So think about that. What was it that drove you to do that particular thing? What interested you about that? How did it connect to you personally and your interests and your personality? So try and, and, and think of those things. Also, look at the before and after story of your customers. So this is really powerful. What does your brand do for people? How do customers feel after they have used your product or after they have engaged in your brand? How does your brand change people? And we did this back in customer avatars or buyer avatars. So you might want to look back there at the work you did there. But really think about what your brand does for people. What, why does your particular brand exist instead of when there's all these other brands? What, what are you doing that's different and interesting? And how is it connected to you and your passions and your interests? And I put this little picture in here. I thought it was so cute. This comes from an eyewear advert. And I thought it was such a unique take. And it was so, forgive me, but eye-catching because... Like all the other pictures you see when people are advertising glasses or spectacles, 
they tend to be these sort of good-looking gentlemen, their hair done nicely and their glasses on, or these ladies with their hair and their glasses. And then they went with these, like, guys that are just giant eyeballs. And I thought that was so amazing because it catches your attention and you can tell they've got a really quirky brand going on. And this is where you've got to be. You've got to be something that makes people stop and go, oh, that's different, that's interesting. And I think too often we're caught up in being really corporate, being professional. As I say, it's like all the people I see who have their suits and headshots on Facebook doing that. And I'm like, that's not real. That doesn't feel like something real that I can engage in. That feels like wearing a mask. Like, I want something that I can connect to and understand. Like, okay, this is who you are. This is what you are giving my business. This is what you're giving me personally. And this is how I can interact with you. So really don't be afraid to do things differently and do things that represent you and your passion and your interest. So this is actually going to be your homework to come up with your proposition, personality and purpose. So hold on to this idea. So if you're kind of getting like overwhelmed with all of this and thinking, well, how does this connect to my products? How is this going to help me get sales? Like I get it, but it seems like a lot of work coming up with your brand. Well, I wanted to just go back to this idea that your products are souvenirs of your brand. So hopefully once you've put all the pieces together with your brand, then your products can come along and just ride off that. And I thought going back to the beginning where we talked about the old spice guy and we had him jumping through the wall with smell is power. I thought it'd be cool to just look at the products that old spice did. And what I loved here, these are actually the products he's selling back there. These are three body washes and they have these cool names, Bear Glove, Hawkridge and Wolfthorn. And they actually have the animals. So they're, they're kind of pulling from that whole, like the eagles on t-shirts and wolves howling at the moon. I kind of feel like they've brought that image. And they also sort of remind me of these pictures you see of like big Russian guys with tattoos. It kind of reminds me of that. So they have brought in those images. And then they did something really clever. At the bottom of the shower gels, they actually really addressed their customer market segments. You know, we talked about segmenting your market into different groups of people. They literally took their, their shower gels and made one for each market segment. So at the bottom, it's a little bit blurry on the slide, but the bear glove says, for the commanding man. And then the Hawkridge one says, so the commanding man, I don't know, I think that's appealing to guys maybe who are in the military, guys who uh, see themselves as the boss going into work, guys who have the, the big ego and want to feed that, that's what Bear Glove is for. And then you've got Hawkridge, and Hawkridge is for guys with swift minds. So there they're going for like the startup guys, the tech guys, um, like the, the guys who see themselves as very clever and geniuses and above. Like it's so clever what they did. And then the third one, I, I don't know about this one, they said for nocturnal creatures. So I think that's maybe for the guys who like sleeping. Um, but I thought that was absolutely genius to, oh, oh, I guess for nocturnal creatures, I guess it's not sleeping, I guess I'm seeing that wrong. I guess it's guys that go out partying and go out clubbing. I just realized that. I've been looking at that thinking it was about sleepy guys, but now I get it. It's for guys that go out partying. They might want to work on that. <laughs> but look at that. That is how you can create products that represent your brand. So your brand, Old Spice, is Guys that know what they want, that want power, that are big personalities, big egos. They want to smell strong. They want people to notice them. And then they segmented that down into their products by actually saying, well, actually, you, this product is for you. And you over there, this product is for you. So they're like almost like sub niches of their main brand. So I think that's a really cool way to look at things. Your products are souvenirs of your brand. Okay, so we talked about finding your brand values and how there are three elements of your brand values. The personality, the proposal, and the purpose. I remembered them, yay. Now let's go a little bit deeper into coming up with ideas for your values. And this especially applies to your proposal. And in fact, probably all those elements, proposal, personality, and purpose. And 
this is kind of an interesting quote. It's from a guy called Blair Warren, and he wrote the One Sentence Persuasion Course, 27 Words to Make the World Do Your Bidding. Well, that sounds epic. I haven't read the book. I, I wonder if that's true. That would be pretty cool. A good start in like establishing my cult. <laughs> With 27 words. Amazing. See, there's, there's a brand right there. 27 words to make the world do your bidding. But anyway, he said, and this is very Machiavellian. He says, people will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, and help them throw rocks at their enemies. And that last sentence has been taken on by all kinds of marketers. A lot of guys are saying, yeah, you've, you've got to get in there and throw rocks at people's enemies. You've got to get your customers with you and get them throwing rocks at enemies with you. And it's kind of considered a bonding thing with your customers to sort of identify an enemy and then band together to say what's wrong with that enemy and to attack them. And often you'll see in sort of Facebook groups or on, in social media, people start doing petitions or they start calling, I'm calling you out or, or doing all of these things. And really it's kind of a group bonding thing. Like, hey, let's all get together and establish that guy is the enemy and we're all gonna throw rocks at him. Cool, are you all with me? Yay, let's do it. And it, I guess it's like mob mentality. But I think you can use this actually in a very positive way. And I've said this seems like a negative exercise to, to sort of target your enemy, but it actually can be quite useful. And what I did was I, I made a list of how we have these dichotomies. We kind of create dichotomies. And I think marketers do it more than anyone else. We mentioned the Pepsi challenge, that Coke and Pepsi have this huge rivalry going on where it's like you, you're either a Coke person or a Pepsi person. But it's really nonsense. I mean, they're both just basically sugar and high fructose corn syrup and caffeine. Like, they're, they're the same thing. There's not really... So it's kind of an artificial rivalry. And just like Coke and Pepsi, another big rivalry is Mac and PC and you can see I used the picture here of the the PC guy and he's all bloated because he has too much software and the Mac guy who's just like a cool regular guy and I think like it can be considered a very negative thing but I think comparisons can be very very powerful in actually telling your customers like this is why we are different this is why we stand out in the US you actually have a lot more scope to do this in the UK a lot of comparison advertising is actually illegal and, and can get you into a lot of trouble with sort of libel and slander laws in the US people use comparison advertising a lot more to say, well, this is what the other guys do, this is what we do. And actually, I mean, one example that I've used, when Isaac and I brought out our original bundle class, we did Bundle Brian and Catherine, and Bundle Brian's telling people all these terrible things about bundles and giving them bad information, and I'm just like, no, this is how you do it properly, yay! And it's that comparison makes it very, very powerful because when people look at other things, they start recognizing it and say, oh, this sounds like Bundle Briard. Like, really? That's, that sounds like what that guy does. I, I think I'm going to go with the other person. And I think comparisons are a very visual way of getting people to look at you and say, okay, that's what you guys are doing. And you don't necessarily have to go and bully a competitor or pick on a competitor. And sometimes, of course, it's a bad idea to do that because you may well end up working with competitors or like having to have some kind of relationship with them. So don't burn your bridges with this unnecessarily. But I think it can be really, really helpful to establish your values by looking at everything else and saying, well, those aren't our values. So, you know, it sounds super negative to say, okay, you should start with a negative, what you don't like about other companies or about your industry. But I think the reason it can be really helpful, and going back to one of the tutorials that I actually mentioned here back on this slide, when they talk about how to define your core brand values, they say you should start with a negative. And the reason for that is because it helps you get very specific about what it is that you actually want to do. So the problem is if you start with a, a positive, 
and you say, well, what are our core values? What, what do we believe in? What are words that sum up what we do? We tend to be rather general and we tend to be rather bland. So we say things like, well, we're reliable, we're creative, we're interesting, we're helpful, we're supportive. Like those aren't very exciting words. They're kind of like nice words, like reliable and trusted that don't really have any emotional impact. People don't buy a product that says reliable or trusted. Like it's good to be reliable or trusted, but those aren't very powerful words. What are powerful words are things that are very specific. So for example, it's easier to say, let's go back to my sort of wedding cake example, my wedding cake idea, when I said, okay, I went in and what was my problem with them? My problem was that the lady said, she, or the lady wouldn't be there until Tuesday who could make our, our cake and we needed a cake made. We wanted to talk about it. We wanted to get some ideas and they weren't very helpful about it. So the way you combat that is to say, we will listen to you right away. We want to make what you want. We are customizing it for your needs. And to be very specific about that, and I think like FedEx have a great example of that, like answer the phone on the first ring. That is a great brand value. Like that's very specific. It's not we have good customer service. It's we will answer the phone on the first ring. And I get the feeling they got there by saying, well, what's everyone else doing wrong? Oh, they wait to answer the phone. It's not a priority. And so you're like, you're on the phone and you're like, derp, derp, derp. And eventually they answer it. FedEx solved that problem and appealed to their customers by saying, we will answer the phone on the first ring. So that's how you can sort of start with a negative and find a very specific positive in there. So when you're setting your values, when you're doing this exercise back here and you're setting out your proposition, your personality, your purpose, think in terms of specifics. Start with a negative and then do the opposite. Now, take my kombucha. I think organics on there and that's a good word. But I think what really establishes their brand is that phrase there that it's made with love. The number one love is our number one ingredient. Like that's interesting, that stands out. That gives you something that you can really aspire to with your brand. You're like, okay, if we think, and if I was this company, if I was this kombucha company, I would like put that on a big whiteboard in the middle of my office and say, love is our number one ingredient. And I would really think about that. I think, what does that mean? How can I use that phrase in everything else we do? How do we represent that? Maybe we choose charities to support that are based on love or marriage or relationships or on reaching out to people in some way. Maybe we will write blog posts on how to share love or how to be a more loving person. Like that can actually affect everything you do with your brand. And the reason is it's specific, it's interesting, it's raw. It kind of goes with what, what Richard Branson said about not trying to be a, an idealized, super professional brand, but trying to do something real and trying to do something interesting. So you want your values, you want your brand values to be interesting and to be real and to be raw. You don't want them to just be, we're a nice company, we make health drinks, we do this. No, you wanna be, love is our number one ingredient. We answer the phone on the first ring. Like These are the kind of things that you can actually build your brand values on. Now, I did include some other dichotomies here, going back to the idea of throwing stones at your enemies. And one thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, a lot of dichotomies, aren't necessarily good versus evil. Like we tend to think of them in that way, but they're just different perspectives. And what it's about really is choosing your perspective. What perspective do you share with your customers? And I see, and it's kind of funny because like I see a lot of Facebook groups for empaths and they always talk about narcissists as the bad guys. They're always, it's kind of like us versus them. We're empaths, we've been victims of narcissists creators versus copycats. So you'll see a lot of groups that are about being creative. And that's definitely something we've looked at in our groups, that we tend to be creative and we say, okay, a lot of other people are copying. They're copying designs, they're copying products. We're all about creating those. Believers and non-believers, that, like, that kind of goes without saying that a lot of people who have a belief or have a faith may 
have that a certain perspective where they're like, okay, I feel more comfortable in a group buying a product that shares my belief. Whereas non-believers may be put off by that and say, well, yeah, that's that's too much about that belief for me. So it's not like necessarily a good versus bad. It's just, what do you share? What do you feel strongly about that you share with your customers? So this kind of taps into that whole concept of polarization that we talked about when we were talking about audience and how much do you want to polarize your audience? It can be very powerful. It can also be kind of dangerous. You can isolate a lot of people. But I feel sometimes it's kind of unavoidable now, especially with the political sort of, I feel politically, people are very, there's some very strong dichotomies in politics at the moment. And sometimes it can be very difficult to avoid that and stay authentic and stay congruent and stay true to your values. But I think being real, ultimately, even if you lose some people along the way, I think that can really strengthen your bond with your actual target audience. And there are some things, like I think this one's really interesting, manifesting versus Dave Ramsey. I'm in a lot of groups about making money, saving money, because obviously with treasure hunting, that's kind of what I do. And I see two very different philosophies. The Dave Ramsey people are all about saving money, not going out to eat, having a very tight budget. Whereas manifesting law of attraction people, they're all about pretend you're a millionaire and it will happen. And it's kind of amazing to see these different viewpoints and how they interact against each other. Like neither of them is really right or wrong. They're both sort of taking something that has an element of truth. Like, yes, if you think big, then it makes it more likely you can achieve greatness. But also on a practical level, if you save money, then that's actually a very practical step towards having more money. So it's not that there's a right or wrong. It's just which perspective is your company, your brand going to take? Um, And I put in here anyone versus haters. And it's actually pretty cool because if you go to answer the public and we talked about answer the public uh yesterday in our class on products but if you go to answer the public you can actually scroll down and see a versus so it actually creates comparisons and dichotomies for you like i put in haters and it has everything versus haters it has mcdonald's versus haters fans versus haters skaters versus haters which would make an amazing t-shirt lovers versus haters and so on. So I think it's it's a really interesting exercise to look at who is your enemy. And remember, like this isn't a literal enemy. It's kind of like playing a game. It's almost like a board game of like, okay, what's my strategy? If the if our competitors, if the other guys are doing this one strategy, what's our strategy? What makes us different? What makes us unique? And that's really what your brand is about. It's about standing out. What is it that makes you different? This isn't about going like yell at other people and say, you're a terrible person and and pick fights with people. This is just about analyzing what makes you different. Okay, so when we talked about customers and when we talked about you, we talked about archetypes and I shared uh, Young's 12 archetypes. And I thought this was a really, really cool infographic that I found at Printsum. And I just wanted to share it with you because I think it's a really fun way to look at brands. And another tool that you have when you're thinking about what your brand is, what you want to represent. And what they did is align brands with different archetypes. So I thought this was really cool. And you might like to look at this and see where your brand fits in. But it actually has Old Spice right on here. And it classes Old Spice as a jester, the very definition of a hedonist. And a a jester fits into this little slice of the circle, which is all about connecting to others. And it says their power is pressure, which is kind of funny. So like they're very forceful. They're, They're putting it out there. I also like that now Axe, I guess, are probably one of their biggest competitors. And it says that Axe are a magician, which is another really sort of interesting one. And it says that magicians are all about power. They have wicked skills that at times seem supernatural. So I know like Axe kind of have the Axe effect or in in England, it's called the Lynx effect, where like a guy walks past and all the girls go, whoa. So it's kind of interesting to see how these brands 
have this identity or at least how this infographic sees their identity and how they act within that identity. So this may be a fun exercise to just look through the archetypes, go back, revisit what we did about archetypes when we were talking about customers and you and think about what brand, what, what, what archetype your brand represents. Okay, so we talked a lot about brand values and now I just wanted to pay a little bit of attention to finding your voice, finding your brand voice. And these examples here are all from Skype's brand book. So the company Skype, they basically do face-to-face -face talking online or telephony, so ways to call people using your computer. And I thought this was just the coolest thing that they put together, this brand book, that really gives you an idea of the personality. We talked about personality of your brand. This is how they express that personality. So what your voice does as a brand is it expresses your values. So we had your values, your values are your proposal, your personality, and your purpose. Your voice is the way you express those values. And what I love is that Skype actually call it all out. They put it right out there. These are words we like. Free, share, whole world, calls, and baboon. They put the word baboon in there to get your attention, to make you laugh, and also to show that they're kind of irreverent and that you can just enjoy using them. And it makes them very, very accessible. And then they say, words we don't like, telephony, peer-to-peer, -peer, VOIP, bill, and supercalifragilistic, etc. I think it's so funny. I mean, they did the comparison thing. We talked about comparisons, so they did the comparisons, because when you think of the other guys, like maybe AT&T, you tend to think of these very boring words, like telephony, whereas like Skype are like, boom, calls, it's free. They keep it super simple, short words that are easily understood. And they also do things like they say, we want to explain what we're about. And it says, sure, we've all heard this before. As a company, we're all used to the notion that Skype is a piece of software that allows people to talk for free. And then they said, but then Mr. Wu, Smith and Blank aren't. They may know nothing about Skype. For all we know, they think the name is some sort of sexually transmitted disease, a pyramid scheme, or a car made in deepest, darkest bohemia. So they're actually kind of laughing at their own brand. They're not taking themselves too seriously. They're saying, we're not corporate. We're really, really different from all the other guys. And I think this makes them a lot more likable. I think it makes them much more appealing to their customers. And I really, really think that even small businesses, like all the big guys are trying to be like us. The big guys, the big corporations with their boardrooms and their shareholders and all the people, they are trying to be like us. They're trying to pretend that they're like us. They're little guys and be like, hey, we're your friend. We're, we're cool. We're, we're little guys. We actually have the advantage because we are legitimately little guys. We're legitimately doing all these things. So one thing I would love to say is don't try and be corporate. Don't try and be something you're not. Like, I think it can be very off-putting when you try and, and sort of make out that you're something that really your actions aren't matching your words. Think about that congruence. Think about what you want to present to people in the long term. But I think this is really cool. I think this is such a great representation of brand. There's also, if you have a moment, there's also an article here that I really enjoyed about creating your brand voice. And it's by Larson.com. And I love this example they used. So they got the buffalo wings, buffalo wild wings. This is their napkins. And it says, we know that some of you are here tonight to embarrass yourselves in public. So like they're just laughing at their customers, but they're kind of like laughing with their customers and saying, hey, we're in on the joke with you guys. And you can see why, because it says the demographic for this brand voice is a social captain an 18 to 24 year old male who typically organizes his friends to meet at the local Buffalo Wild Wings. Do you see how this all fits together? Everything we did about customer avatars and buyer avatars, this is right here. They have come up with their buyer avatar, the social captain, this 18 to 24 year old male, and then 
They've made the the napkins, they've even made the napkins express their brand values, their voice to him. That, yeah, this is a place to come and have a good time. No one cares if you're going to embarrass yourselves. You've got permission to have fun here and to do silly things here. And it says, we enjoy the show underneath there. So they're like, yes, you enjoy yourself. Have fun. Let your hair down. And I think that's such a great example, just like Skype of being real, of using the voice that your customers want to hear. 18 to 24 year old guys don't want to hear stuffy, formal voices, especially when they're going on a night out. They want that fun voice. And if you go down, there's actually some really good tips and ideas in here in in this article. They also show this, which is pretty awesome. This convention billboard with graffiti on it. Like what a way to put something there in such a strong voice putting this graffiti out there, shaping the future of IT. It has that sort of rebel feel to it. Like, yeah, like think about archetypes again. What kind of archetypes does this represent? Which which character speaks in this sort of big graffiti rebel voice? Like, it's pretty amazing. The other thing that I liked on this, oops, let me see. I think it's, oh, there it is. I really like this point on in the last article. It says, listen, listen to your customers before you write. Make sure you listen. How do your customers communicate? Are they formal and precise or casual and conversational? Listen is an accurate verb here. Think of music. You don't want to sound like Brahms when your audience is listening to Beck. So what it's saying is talk like your customers. Join in with your customers. Use the same voice that they are using. And you can find this out by just going to whatever social media spots they hang out on. Listen when you're out and about in public. Listen to people. Like, try and hang out in the places where your customers go. Like, I'm always kind of amazed when I go to the gym and I hear how people talk in the gym. And they have a very different tone. They have a very sort of like, yeah, bro, come on, bro. Most people around me don't talk like that. So it's kind of fun to go different places and hear how people speak in different situations and in different demographics so listen listen to how your customers talk okay so one last thing we've talked about values we talked about brand values we talked about brand voice now i want to talk about how to name your brand or name your products because i know a lot of people struggle and get stuck when they come to actually putting a name on things but i think giving anything a name is really really powerful Isaac and I spend, we've spent so long brainstorming names. Like even our bundle masterclass, we spent a long time brainstorming the word masterclass. We were like, well, is it a course? Is it a class? Is it training? And then we came up with masterclass and we were like, yes. I I think probably from Oprah. I think Oprah originally had masterclass. And I know now it's like a big brand, the masterclass. But we really took a long time thinking of that. And then create curate cultivate all those names we especially create we sat and we we took a long time thinking about what do we want to tell our customers do we want to say this is a private label course or this no create that's the message we want to give to people and i think that putting a name on something like it kind of makes it real as well when you're brainstorming a product Give it a name as soon as possible because that's like with tangent we 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 did that we wanted to have tangent as the name even when we were still in the development stages because we were like what does this software do and we're like well it sends us on a lot of tangents we keep finding out new things it's very much about divergent thinking so we came up with the name tangent and it really helps you solidify what your product is about we're like oh okay great that's what it does it helps you find out new ideas it helps you discover things it helps you learn so tangent is a great name for it so give things a name early on anyway how do you choose a name well i'll go through kind of one of my methods for doing it and hopefully this will be helpful to you at least it gives you a starting point when you're coming up with names but there's no right or wrong way to choose a name if the name appeals to you and sometimes i find you just have that aha moment where you you a name comes to mind and you go yes that is the like even when you're naming children i don't know i i found all my children's names kind of came to me and i was like oh that's her name or that's his name and i just sort of knew and i've always found that the same with products as well but if you're stuck here's a method that you can use for coming up with a name 
And when you find something that feels good and you're like, yes, I like that, go with that. If you don't get that feeling, then stick with it a bit longer and keep trying. Because you should get that feeling. I think that, yes, this is the right name, is, is your signal. But this is how you do it. So first of all, take a look at your product. What does your product do? So I got an idea here. I said, okay, my product is a stormproof umbrella. It will keep me dry and it protects you from the rain. It doesn't blow inside out when it's windy and it will protect you during your commute to work. So you might come up with some more things that you can put there, like where you could store it or maybe it, it I don't know. Think of all the problems that an umbrella solves. It's portable. You can carry it around, like write all of those things down and then write down the features. OK, it's available in multiple colors. It has heavy duty fabric, very reliable mechanism easy to operate so first of all do that say what what does your product do what problems does it solve what features does it have now generate some words by looking at these sentences forget all about umbrellas you don't have to think about umbrellas and an answer what else so go through this and say what else keeps you dry what else protects you from the rain so you might have a shield an armor what protects you what keeps you safe? What else is multicolored? What else is safe from the wind? What is portable? Like start thinking of all these words and just write them down as you think of them. So I put down like shield, armor, canopies, rainbows because they're multicolored. What else is multicolored? Rainbows are multicolored. What else is heavy duty? Steel is heavy duty. Lead. I don't know. Kevlar. Like what else is heavy duty? What has a reliable mechanism? I don't know, that, that's kind of a hard one. I mean, if they're hard, just skip it, it doesn't matter. And easy to operate. You can write down words about that, like simple or, but use that what else idea. Okay, so you've got some words written down now by doing what else. Now you can also go to thesaurus.com and find synonyms and antonyms for some of your keywords. So the keywords are things like umbrella, rain, windy, protection. Like go and just go to thesaurus and type in all of those words and see what it gives you. Like I, I looked up windy and I got things like bluster and breeze, breezy. Those are great words squall maybe not windswept like write all these words down look up umbrella i got shade brolly shelter parasol and rain oh my gosh i got some great words for rain like precipitation cloud burst cloud burst umbrellas boom you could be done with that like that's a great word barrage like all of these words and even find antonyms like antonyms for rain arid that's that's a good word and then once you've got all these words, once you've been browsing, so there's two things really going on here. Ask yourself what else, what else does all these things, and then look up synonyms for keywords. And then write them all down on a big piece of paper. Just get a huge piece of paper and write down all the most interesting, fun words, all the words that you like. So I put down some of my favorite words. I like raining cats and dogs. I thought that was kind of fun. I thought that'd be a great brand, actually, to have cats and dogs umbrellas. So it's like literally it's raining cats and dogs, but maybe you could also sell umbrellas with cats on and umbrellas with dogs and call your brand cats and dogs. Whoa. So that was another idea. But just write down all the words that you like that have something to do with umbrellas, rain, wind, protection, commuting, all of those things. And then once you've got them all written down, you can just start playing with them. So you can merge them together. You can change the spellings. You can create acronyms. I thought that was funny. I came up with raindrop. Reliable and immensely neat device rids our precipitation. I'm sure you can come up with catchier acronyms than that, but come up with acronyms. And I mean, just by playing with these words, I put together like all sorts of ideas. The rain breaker. Like that sounds like something you'd see as seen on TV. Bluster proof umbrellas. That's a great word. And some are kind of weak. Rainbow strong. I don't like that. Barrage brella. Mm. And if you're not happy with them, then play with them a bit. Barabrella, maybe. I like breeze because I had breezy and breeze. So I thought breeze was kind of cool if you took the E off. I thought canopy was a great word. There was canopy came up as another word for umbrella. You could spell it with a K. And then I had the idea of like canopoo. I thought that was kind of a fun word. 
it sounds kind of hipster or rain cover like just mess with the spelling mess with those ideas and just by looking at these words and writing them down and sort of playing with them and putting them together you can come up with all kinds of potential words for your umbrella so that's really the process that i use there's also a cheat method as well which is you can go to wordoid.com or coolnameideas.com and both of those websites will help you choose a name in fact this is wordoid here so you can create wordoids by putting in something like rain and it will try and make words that sound like english words including the word rain so a lot of it will just be nonsense and will be noise but you can really click through it to get some ideas also when you come up with a name there's two things you want to do you want to make sure your chosen word is not a live trademark in a similar industry it's funny with with trademarks because if your word is being used by a different industry you might be absolutely fine like if there's mcdonald's restaurants but you want to have like mcdonald skirts because you're making scottish skirts and no one else has made mcdonald's skirts that actually should be okay but you might want to stay away from really big brands just because it, it can be like difficult to find domain names and things like that but generally you want to make sure that your chosen word is not an existing trademark in a similar industry and we have the test check chrome extension that you can use to actually check uspto very very easily all trademarks are registered on uspto.gov so you can actually go there and search for trademarks and it's free it's easy to use so use that to make sure that the word you want isn't a trademark in the category you want to use it in and also you will probably want to make sure that a domain name is available the thing with domains now is that most good.com domains have gone like it's really difficult to get something like umbrella.com so what i tend to do is look at the other domains like dot rocks or dot cooking or dot today like you don't need a dot com these days you can do umbrella dot rocks and that could be your brand like your domain name can actually be part of your brand now so i mean we we kind of did it with tangent we did tangent rocks and i think it's absolutely fine to do that now i think there's still sort of snobbery around dot com domain names but as far as i know there isn't that much advantage now even from a point of view of seo and google i believe that domains are all being treated the same now so it doesn't matter whether you're using dot com or dot rocks google will still find you okay so i know there was a lot in today's class you have fairly simple homework i think which is basically write down the three p's of your brand your promise your proposition and your personality and you can use all of the tools that we've talked about the throwing rocks at your enemies to help you kind of identify those more tightly i have fun with it like don't drive yourself nuts with it be specific and have fun with it like instead of saying our product will make you feel healthy say our product will make you feel like an energetic eight-year-old without the i don't know what do eight-year-olds do that's awful without the snot like come up with something specific don't use the snotty eight-year-old that's a terrible idea but you could come up with something specific about your brand but try and avoid generalities because it will make your work a lot easier as you go on in developing your brand and developing your products also think about choosing an archetype that represents your brand so go back to this slide where we talked about archetypes and also go back and visit the other slides back in the you and your archetype go and revisit that if you chose an archetype that you think you click with and see if that archetype can help you help inform what you want to say about your brand and your brand values and optionally i've given you two optional exercises as well thinking back to skype and how they had the words we like words we don't like can you come up with three words your brand likes and three words your brand hates and then you have one more optional exercise which is generate at least one name for your company, your brand or your product or a potential product. So you don't have to actually make the product, you don't have to be planning it, but try and come up with a name because amazing things happen when you come up with names and you create names for things. 
So I hope you've enjoyed this class on brand values and voice. We will be back to talk about brand visuals and styles, but have a lot of fun with this. Have fun with the homework, enjoy it, and get creative. Creating a brand is fun. It is awesome. It's one of the coolest things you can do. And remember, your brand can help you make a change in the world.